thanks everyone for being with us today. Uh, join us again. If you were with us last week, I'm Austin Detweiler. I'm the managing editor of Philanthropy Daily. I hope you've had a chance to keep up with our daily articles over at philanthropydaily.com. Uh, if you haven't, they are still there. We've had a lot of coverage on the COVID pandemic and, and how to fundraise right now. Uh, and several other resources like, you know, remote work advice from a uh, fourth century monk. Uh, we've got a letter to donors during an economic downturn, a piece on how the arts community is dealing with the economic downturn, uh, and, and, and lots more still to come. If you have any questions you'd like covered in Philanthropy Daily or topics you think we should discuss, I'd love to hear from you. My email will be in the chat box in just a minute, so uh, feel free to be in touch. Um, before we jump into direct mail, I just want you to encourage everybody to be thinking about how your organization can provide resources to donors and your broader audience right now. So you all know that Zoom has made itself available for free to schools. Uh, nonprofits want to think the same way. That's just one example. So I saw, uh, you know, paid curriculum for homeschoolers. They started offering free resources to parents. They sent an email blast right when things started getting crazy. And I'm sure from that, they'll find new subscribers who will become customers who will eventually become donors. Um, yesterday, I was talking to a client of mine that works with students and suggesting, you know, putting together some materials that they would have given their students in person, but, you know, now to share them digitally. The goal here being keep serving constituents as much as you can. Stay in touch. Don't go silent. Um, if you don't have content to provide, there's other ways to keep them engaged. Uh, I've received a few emails from the orchestra here in Philadelphia. Uh, you know, they're proclaiming our curtains will rise again. Um, the optimism here is welcome right now, uh, and they're keeping me engaged when I might otherwise fall away. Uh, it, you know, if you read online journals, you know a lot of them have online and print editions. I've seen a lot going online for free right now. This is a nice act of generosity when everybody's sort of stuck at home, worried, busy reading too much about you know epidemiology, um, and these are the sorts of things that will engage customers, and once we're past all this, you have a chance to reacquire them and keep them involved. Um, from a fundraising perspective, these are the kinds of things you can then share with donors. Show them how you're being nimble and how you're being creative in a tough time. Show them that you're worth supporting uh, and that you're still in need of support. It's not as if you know, you've know you sort of stopped working. So take some time to be creative and think about what you can do to stay active uh, and have some news to give your donors and, uh, and keep them involved. So uh, let's jump into today's topic on direct response fundraising. Unsurprisingly, we've had countless questions on this topic, so I'm really excited to have Eric Strife and Olivia Smith with us today to start answering those questions. Just a reminder, uh, you can send questions into our Q&A box anytime. Just hover your mouse over uh, my face and you'll see the Q&A button. We'll monitor the questions. We'll do as many as we can. Um, and if we're, if we're able, we'll, we'll follow up with you after the webinar and be in touch. Um, so as we discuss direct mail and really anything related to fundraising during the coronavirus pandemic, our overarching point is that your strategy should not be changing, but your tactics or how you execute your strategy probably need to adjust. So yesterday, my colleague Matt Gherkin had an article in Philanthropy Daily on uh, the importance of direct mail for a well-rounded development program. In other words, before, during, and after a crisis, you need to be sending mail to have a stable and growing fundraising effort. So our goal today is to think about how to keep your direct mail smart in this new environment. Uh, our speakers today to deal with that are Eric Streif and Olivia Smith. Eric is a senior managing consultant with American Philanthropic. He runs our direct response group. He has led numerous nonprofits, including international organizations with uh, budgets over $100 million in annual revenue. His key interest today is to help organizations make their mail programs more strategic, especially by incorporating multi-channel and digital strategies, uh, which he'll tell you more about. Olivia is the Vice President of Client Services at Wyland, a list cooperative for direct mail fundraising. So we're really excited to have her with us today. I'm sure many of you have worked with Wyland for your direct mail program. We certainly do with many of our clients. Uh, Olivia has been in direct marketing and fundraising for over three decades, providing strategic direction to national and international organiza organizations of all sizes. Now at Wyland, she oversees a team of directors who support hundreds of nonprofits 
with their data modeling. Uh, you also see we have Justin Strife with us again today. Justin is a partner with American Philanthropic. He's spent most of his career fundraising, uh, and he'll be here today to help field questions and provide additional perspective during Q&A. Before I hand it off to Eric, one more thing. I just want to add that we aren't coming here with all of the answers. Uh, anyone who claims to know exactly how to fundraise during a pandemic is probably peddling snake oil solutions. Uh, and you want to be careful. Our goal is to think through this together, so to leverage our shared knowledge and experience and to come up with the best solutions and recommendations for the countless organizations out there looking for help. Uh, so we've got Eric and Olivia will give us some recommendations and then about 30, 35 minutes for Q&A at the end. So with that, Eric, I'm gonna kick it right over to you. Great, uh, thank you, Austin, I appreciate that. And thank you everybody for participating today. We greatly appreciate it and we look forward to the dialogue later in this uh, webinar. And even after the webinar, we look forward to the dialogue as Austin pointed out. We're welcoming people call us at any time uh, for advice, help. We love giving advice and opinions and sharing our ideas. So. We look forward to that. I just wanted to start with a few overall comments just based on you know, strategy, branding, messaging, because uh, I think that's where it all starts, right? Um, and we believe that nonprofits you know, must continue to communicate with their constituents, and in some cases, even more, right? So a lot of people are thinking about pulling back or re refining it or pausing things way too much. So you have to stay the course, communicate, uh, don't pull back if in some cases go more, and then also to continue to fundraise. Um, and the reason for this, keep your organization top of mind, right? So you want to stay in front of people, you want to stay relevant, and you want to be in their mind. So all along, just like any marketing initiative takes place, is to keep people connected with you. And then fundraising-wise, we just can't stop that. As you know, that's the lifeblood of your organization. That's what's feeding and fueling your programs. And the general message there is, in most cases, programmatic needs are increasing, not decreasing. You know, that may not be 100% the case, for all of you, but many of you, it certainly is the case. And so there's no reason to take your foot off the pedal on fundraising because you need the money now, regardless of what's happening around you. The other thing is just do not pretend that we're, the world is not different now, right? I mean, we can't bury our head in the sand and pretend it's not existing, right? Uh, what's happening. Uh, so pretending it doesn't exist or overreacting in some kind of a you know, apoc apocalyptic way would be just as detrimental too. So we want to be somewhere down the middle of the road and giving a tip of the hat to this issue. Um, and while we're doing that, being authentic, clear, meaningful, relevant, all those to strengthen the rela relationships that we have when they will all yield positive results uh, down the road. And at the end of the day, direct mail is still one of the most effective ways to stay in touch and communicate and fundraise even in times of crisis. Uh, yes, in many cases, donations will decline. Uh, direct response rates may decline. It's going to depend on the sector you're in. It's going to depend on your message. It's going to be depend on your brand, how known you are, well-known you are, and that kind of thing. But over time, um, that you still need to be out there, right? Even if you're, de you're declining, you, you may need to fundraise even more to make up for that. So at a minimum, we need to maintain that ongoing relationship with our current owners and other supporters, whether it's volunteers, key stakeholders and those kind of things so that we do stay connected with them. We work with several organizations where volunteers, uh, like a homeless shelters, things like that, or things of that nature, uh, where volunteers can't even, you know, it's, they, they may not want to be there, number one, and number two, there may be uh, certain guidelines from CDC that they won't allow that, right? But we still need to keep in touch with them and they probably want to be great cheerleaders from the sidelines and, and help in any way they can. Um, and then, but organizations that choose to forge ahead and not bury their head in the sand over the course of time and history has proven that they do better in the long run. There's just no question about it. And that applies to both acquisition and house file mailings. There's plenty of readily available information out there to support this. But anecdotally, uh, this has been true across my personal decades. I, I, I may or may not be the oldest person in the room here, but I'm probably up there. And I've had decades of experience in for-profit and nonprofit fundraising and marketing. And um, it's just been my, my, been my experience over the decades that, yeah, stay the game, stay the course, keep going, and it, it pays out in the long run. But direct mail is an incredibly effective way to do this. And, you know, we've got to think back, and I'm, I'm sure Olivia may talk about this as well, but 
the receiving mail this day and age, for me anyway, maybe it's for many of you and many of your donors, you think about it. My mailbox is, you know, 50 feet away from the house. I walk out to the street to pick up my mail. Like as crazy as it sounds for many people, that's a highlight of the day. Oh, the mailman came, the mailwoman came. I'm going to go out and get my mail. So direct mail is taking on a whole new meaning right now for many people uh, as we shelter in place and so on and so forth. Lastly, and this just kind of the larger uh, messaging standpoint is advocate for your mission, have your donors and supporters advocate for your mission, share deep gratitude. We've got to be grateful for what we are, be upbeat, be grateful for donors, be grateful for the world that we live in, all those things, kind of a positive side of things, and then promote community. Back to the point of volunteers, I've seen many organizations as an example, uh, rallying people to sew masks for hospital workers and things like that. It's a really beautiful thing getting together or doing it in their home and, and sewing masks and things like that for people that needed first responders and that sort of thing. So are there, there are ways that we could promote community no matter what kind of nonprofit we are. Um, so, so moving forward a little bit, just a little more practical things here. Um, so on the communication level, everything in my point, viewpoint right now should somehow give a tip of the hat to the global crisis. Um, Otherwise, where message will seem kind of out of touch and irrelevant. Again, you don't want to overplay your hand uh, too much, but because at the end of the day, we need to be true to our brand and our ethos. Who are we? We don't want to deviate from that, from who we are. That always needs to be reinforced. The core message and the brand mission always remain the same, but the tactical delivery of that message and that brand can shift and change and be modified. And that's what we're doing now. And as Austin pointed out, that's what we're advocating is reshaping how we're articulating our message and our brand, but staying true to our brand. So don't overdo it, but don't minimize it either, right? You need to find that voice and tone and stick to it. And over the next days and weeks and months, this may change by the way, right? As Austin mentioned as well, this is a changing environment. We don't know what's gonna to happen tomorrow, what shoe's gonna drop and so on and so forth. So it's important that we're crafting our copy and messaging on real time and not being tone deaf, but also making sure we're hitting a chord with our donors and not overplaying that hand. I mean, at some point, and I'm honestly getting kind of close to it, I'm, it there's, you get a lot of emails, a lot of things, everything's preface, right? Well, these are troubling times. I know we're all in troubling times. I know we're, you know, you are likely sheltering in place like I am. I just wanted to share this. You know, at some point we're all gonna be like, we get it, we're all sheltered in place. You don't need to remind me of that, right? Um, but does that mean we don't talk about it? Not necessarily, but again, that's about the tone and the message, right? How we share that. So being authentic, timely, and relevant. Um, and as, as I mentioned, that means not ignoring what's going on in the world. Um, but look at the positive of that. How are, is your organization uh, demonstrating how you're making a positive real world, your real world solution? And I guarantee if you spend enough time, no matter what your organization is, you can find a way, you can articulate, you can distill down what you're doing in some way, shape, or form that you're making some kind of real world impact on people. Maybe your staff is you know, all furloughed and they're making masks for first responders at home. Well, that's your organization making an impact. You, you've cultivated a, a group of people that want to get back. Maybe you can explain personally or your family or employees how they're impacted, how your programs are impacted and so forth. Sharing, being very personal. I think the idea here is to be real, to keep it real. We wanna be as real as possible. If there ever was a time to be real and to show, you know, not get caught up in like fancy words or fancy jargon or anything, but to be like raw and real, like this is now, right? Um, and then don't, don't uh, make it seem like your problems at your organization are greater than or lesser than others, right? So uh, we don't wanna, you know, ever go out there like, well, my problems are bigger than your problems, that type of thing, right? And then, and so we need to empathize with people, but we don't want to patronize either, right? Um, now last, so revisit, so revisiting, uh, bottom line on that revisit and refine your message platform, your tone, your voice, your key talking points may change, yes. If we're, um, you know, the symphony or something, our key talking point might be who our, our uh, world-class um, conductor is or something like that, right? But no, maybe that's third in line now. Maybe our key talking point is the fact we're closed and are, are and we're doing some things from uh, uh, you know remotely or something like that. We're going to change our talking points, but still sticking to the clear message. 
So that needs to be laid out very clearly, what I call the message platform for everything from not just your fundraisers, but your staff, you know, when the phone call comes in or whatever it might be, your PR efforts, how you're creating um, your press releases, your blog posts, all those things need to be speaking back to and supporting that message platform, incredibly important. So some practical ways, even in direct mail that we're doing right now, particularly with things that were in the works, so to speak, is putting lift notes in uh, to email uh, programs like an acquisition is ready to go out. Hey, let's work with the friend and let's get a lift note in there right away. Let's put a sticky note on the appeal letter, uh, those kind of things. What can we do to impact something in the works? And then as we have a little more time, we're saying, okay, let's revise this copy a little bit. Let's change this around. But again, if we're working with an organization helping people in Southern Sudan, there's a certain talking points that are important may or may not, the, the realities in the US may not be as impactful there. They're having their certain, their, their own issues. But so we wanna may talk about what, what's happening, but the bigger issue might be getting medical supplies uh, to, to different people that need it, right? So that makes sense. Uh, the other thing is I think looking for ways, don't just look at the boilerplate things like, gee, I gotta change my copy. I gotta put a lift note, I've gotta do that. What can we do to be out of the box? Um, for example, um, you know, depending on what you are, which organization is, maybe there's a downloadable PDF you could create. You have great writers do the 10 best ways to survive COVID-19 financial upheaval, uh, 10 indispensable resources for small business owners in a COVID-19 world. Those business owners are being hammered. Like, you know, that would get downloaded millions of times probably if you had some kind of an answer for small business owners. So be creative in channeling a unique, your unique mission, but how you're addressing it. Uh, Couple of examples of that I, I, it's not a nonprofit, but uh, over the weekend, you know, I follow this DJ, D Nice, if you're familiar with him on Instagram, and he's one of the bigger LA uh, 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 DJs, but he's holed up in his LA apartment. So he started doing these jam sessions. He had 150,000 people on Sunday where he's doing just a jam session for 10 hours, a 10 hour jam session. He did again yesterday promoting people to uh, register to vote and things like that. This has just launched, you know, this has just taken his, uh, you know, awareness, you know, to a huge level. The Shedd Aquarium, if you saw, saw what the Shedd Aquarium did, where they closed it down, obviously, but they opened up the aquarium to the uh, penguins. And the, as they walked around, they filmed them as they walked around and looked at the, as, as penguins do with their little head twitching around, looking at the different exhibits. It was classic. It, it would made, just went, blew off the internet and it was beautiful, it was really cute, it was human, it was real, it's true to their mission, but it's also reflecting the fact that, hey, we're all shut down. Uh, Metropolitan Opera streaming uh, the rec uh, La Boheme recently for free, streaming that, making that available, not charging for it, fantastic. True to their mission, but acknowledging the fact that if we shut in, we're gonna provide some form of entertainment. So while the, the primary objective for direct mail for most of us is to fundraise, it's also an opportunity to be purposeful in our mission and to help those that are in crisis and to be a benefit to the greater community. I think we need to think beyond ourselves instead of just me. How can we be part of that community? And I think those three things, the D-Nice, the Shed Aquarium and Metropolitan Opera kind of share that a bit on that. Those are my quick thoughts on that. I'm gonna come back a bit later on digital. I'm gonna pass it to Olivia and she's going to talk about refining the strategy and segments that are mailed. Olivia? All right. Thank you very much. And I uh, appreciate everything Austin and Eric has said. And I certainly echo all those comments. And thank you all for your time this afternoon as we sort of soldier together something that none of us have ever experienced before. Um, it is a mistake to think that everyone is just going to stop giving. Right. I mean, truly, some of them will. And as Eric said, our response rates won't be what they were before. But on the other hand, there'll be other people who actually want to do more. Um, and regardless of whatever your own personal feelings are about giving or not giving now, that's important also not to let that come into play. How many of us have always sat in um, in creative sessions and said, well, I'd never give to that package. And yet we know it works like gangbusters. So again, we need to sort of take that part out of our thinking as we're looking at strategy. Um, as Eric has said, we really need to continue to communicate. Um, and so now the question becomes, well, all right, but how do I do that and how do I do it smarter? 
Um, obviously, acquisition is an, is an important and key question. It's one I know I deal with a lot in our job, um, is trying to find new donors. And, uh, and I agree 100%. Now is not the time to just pull out of the game. Uh, you have to just be smarter about what you're doing. Uh, maybe your campaign might not be quite as large as it was. I know a lot of organizations have very deep, large, lapsed files, and they, t they uh, tap those files in order to, to mail. And as long as, you know, uh, there's a good cost to acquire or reacquire in that case, it makes sense. But maybe this time you don't need to go as deeply lapsed if you're using an RFM strategy. Um, maybe you don't go to the uh, single gift donors or the low dollar donors. Um, maybe what you focus on are some of the ones that are a higher gift. Now that may be 100 plus in your organization, or if your base average gift is $10, maybe that's a $50 donor. It's all different for every organization. Certainly you want to focus on those who do give repeat gifts because they are the ones who are most loyal to you. And as was just stated, donors are loyal to organizations. They understand that this is putting a stress on, on you and especially the ones who are more able to give, um, they're going to be more generous in most cases. Um, if another opportunity is to use modeling, I mean, that is something that becomes an important part of being able to find the cream of the crop. Um, when you can't use just RFM strategies, modeling can help you determine what are the best names that I should be mailing now. Um, another important thing is just don't think, and I know you might get this from your board members or your executive team who's going to say, well, why can't we just cancel this mailing and let's double down later, right? We're just going to go get another 300,000. We're just going to push that and we'll mail, you know, half a million, 600,000 at the next opportunity. Well, for a lot of organizations, that's not realistic. They are either so niche that they can't find the rest of the other lists, and so they're already tapping into their best list. And so now when they need to double down, they, don't, they have to go to secondary or tertiary list sources, and their overall response rate is going to be even worse. So it's really an important part to just continue the course. It may mean you, you, you refine your list selection. You're staying more with your continuation and your core list means you might not be trying out new test lists because the environment is so different right now. We don't know whether those test reads will be accurate. Another thing kind of on the other side of that is the creative. If you have a great creative package or this is when you're about to test a new HVP premium, maybe not the best time. Save those dollars. Those are going to be expensive dollars because they're small uh, panels, small test panels. Take those, uh, those precious test dollars and put them more into some of your continuations and the controls. So you do need to tweak, you need to refine, but you don't want to change too much because as we all know as direct marketers, what we built works and it works for a reason. It's just going to have some modification. And certainly with all the creative um, opportunity that Eric has spoken to about changing your message and being real, I think has some great opportunity. You know, when I think about these LAPS donors, lots of times LAP donors are just LAPS because they're, 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 they're not apathetic. They just don't have a good enough reason to come back. Well, your message now might give them a good enough reason to come back. Uh, and so be, be certain to, uh, to leverage that. So I think number one, definitely don't stop what you're doing in terms of acquisition, but definitely refine your strategy for greater success. All right. Well, then there's the house mailings. Of course, we all know that's really where a lot of our bread and butter is, as you say, right? It's what keeps us alive. And this is where communication becomes very, very important. Um, refining your segmentation here, just like we talked about the laps, becomes equally important. Uh, you might not go as broad and deep in your file, uh, and you certainly want to look at the people who are giving higher gifts. Um, and you want to be able to, uh, to leverage them for maybe even special requests, all depending, again, on the nature of your organization. Uh, that's going to be um, different for every person. But loyal donors, donors who are on sustainer programs, um, they want to continue supporting you during this crisis. Um, you can't disappear while others are making noise. You know, one of the things you always hear about, and if this was certainly true after 9-11, is after people dropped out of a lot of things, guess what? You didn't have to do as much to look as large. You actually had more sort of share of voice or share of space 
because others disappeared. So sometimes, some people, it makes sense to go bigger, as Eric mentioned earlier, but sometimes even just staying the course makes you look bigger because others have made other decisions to sort of reduce the noise in, in the space. Um, another thing to consider is, of course, digital. And I know Eric's going to be talking about digital, but co-targeting your acquisition mail, co-targeting your donor mail um, with uh, uh, you know, social media, Facebook, or programmatic display ads, where that becomes very important. We are all stuck at home, right? We're all going to know our four walls so well. And what are people doing? Well, they're on their phones. They're on the Internet. They're, they're, you know, we, I, I'm here in Colorado. We just went on lockdown as of 8 a.m. this morning. Got that horrible amber alert sound screeching through the phones. If you weren't awake, you're awake now. Um, that keeps us at home and keeps us focused on our screens. And so knowing uh, that you have presence and branding in both places uh, becomes important. So bottom line key takeaways are don't uh, stop your acquisition mailings, refine the list and modify your strategy, but don't th change things too much. Stick with proven methods. Um, and with your house files, same thing. Let's just be smarter about what we do, the segments that we pull. And again, if you have the right message, maybe you're going to go to some segments you haven't gone to before uh, if it's the right message, uh, and that's what we need to learn. And uh, and in, incorporate digital tactics where possible uh, to add an extra boost to your campaign effectiveness. And last but not least, let's remember that the American public and, and the American public, that's you, that's me, that's each one of us, right? We're still doing our jobs, but we're living this each day to day. We all feel a sense of a loss of control um, around the surroundings. Um, I went to the grocery store, no eggs, zero. Well, I had to punt and do something else. Um, I want control, and this is what donors want. And so the ability to give is a great thing for the soul. Giving helps people feel like they're making a difference, like they're having control. And individuals, especially those who are most loyal to you, are the ones that are going to be able to step up and give to you because they want some control. They want to be able to make a difference when all is said and done, rather than just looking at their four walls. So uh, again, we'll be back with the question and answer, but uh, let me pass this back over to Eric. Thank you, Olivia. Great points. Really appreciate it. I'm going to talk a bit about digital outreach and fundraising. I'm going to try to do it very quick. We have tons of questions, so we want to get to that. Real quickly, first off, just want to clarify something. Uh, Olivia made a great point about RFM. And I, for those in, in, out there that aren't familiar with RFM, it's the basis for most of the segmentation, particularly for a house file how recently someone gave, how frequently they give, you know, they give five times over their lifetime, five times in the last year, and the monetary value, what was their last gift, what's their largest gift, things like that. So if that's something out there, it could be off, off the mark, but if that's something out there that somebody wanna know about, that's a definition. Recency, frequency, monetary value, basis for most segmentation that we do. Um, for acquisition and house file, it's a little more uh, important, not that it's more important, but a little more complex for house file but also used for uh, acquisition. So on digital outreach and fundraising, bottom line, keep it simple. Like let's not reinvent the wheel, right? If you don't have a digital response tactic in place, tactics in place or a strategy even, you really should do it, but don't do it just to do it. You need to do it with a, a deliberate sense of having it integrate with your direct mail and with your other forms of communication, social media, email, any other kind of outreach you might be, in, be doing. So. If you can, you should allocate funds. It's a great time. Again, people, we've already said it, but people are at home, people are glued to social media and they're engaged and they're involved. Um, so I think that's important. Also, it's really important not just to publish. So I just said, like, get involved in digital, but don't just publish to publish. That's like the worst thing you can do. And we see that all the time. That just creates noise and creates, it, it doesn't engage people. The bottom line is you need to engage people. And ultimately on social or digital, digital means there's really two things that we're doing. We're either educating or we're entertaining. And when I say educated, I don't mean uh, getting a degree. It could be informing people, letting people do research, a downloadable uh, how-to or a white paper, or something like that. Educate, inform, and entertain. It really fits in those two buckets. Um, and so keep that in mind, kind of the idea. How can I educate? How can I entertain? And if you're a total organization that's just focused on educating, like a think tank or something like that, you're more like in the headspace, 
Well, is there a way it can entertain? I don't know what the answer to that is. You have to determine, but people want to be entertained right now, as we pointed out earlier with the Shed Museum, the uh, Metropolitan Opera, and uh, D Nice, the DJ. The other thing is, if you are going to post and go out on social and those things, uh, you need to monitor and moderate. So monitor it. You got to keep track of what's going on, what's happening, and then, then moderate. You've got to answer. You got to respond. You got to retweet. You got to be involved. So it means stepping in and having an interactive conversation with people by responding, by asking questions, sharing, sharing relevant information, providing opportunities for people to engage. And I say engage purposely. It's not just to donate. It's to engage with you and get involved. Watch a video. Download that white paper we talked about. Watch the penguin walk through the museum, whatever it might be. Um, craft the emails that you do around the direct mail program, craft it around the direct mail message and have it go out at the same time, maybe before the mail date or the in-home date rather, maybe on the in-home date as close as you can get it and after. Maybe you kind of bookend it and think about that. Don't think about, oh, I just sent one email, that's great. You need to send multiple emails that gotta be out there. You gotta try to do forwards. If your executive director is sending an email, then maybe the uh, development director is doing a forward. Hey, I hope you saw the email yesterday from our executive director, it's really important. I hope you have a chance to read it. Um, and then don't overlook uh, your SEO, search engine optimization, SEM, search engine marketing, looking for uh, social media opportunities, uh, and then even uh, paid media uh, and native advertising and things like that, maybe in your wheelhouse, depending on your organization, or Facebook uh, lookalike uh, audience uh, campaigns, those kind of things. Be looking for ways that you can do that as well. They're very effective right now, I think, to a certain degree, what we're seeing are gonna be more effective right now. Uh, bottom line, keep the messaging, you know, stick to the messaging principles we talked about earlier, sticking to your mission and brand and uh, sticking to that, but engage at that deeper level that we talked about. Integrate between online and offline channels. Think about educating and entertaining. Think about those two concepts and don't publish unless it's meaningful, thoughtful, useful, and encourages some type of engagement. That is just like critical to everything. Don't publish for the sake of publishing. That's what I have truncated on the digital and we can, I'll hand it over to you. We'll jump into questions. I'll take over here for a minute. Um, I had one queued up here, uh, someone emailed me about, so, and we've got other ones lined up here as well. But um, the first one is uh, plan giving. Should we do a plan giving mailing right now uh, with everything that's going on? And really what I would say, there's, you kind of have three options here. Um, one, if you don't have the funding right now, uh, your things are a little bit tight as we've been talking about with mail and you maybe as Olivia said, you don't want to spend a little extra cash doing an insert or buying that more expensive list. Same thing applies here with plan giving. If you're a little tight, you're looking at where to put some limited resources, I might kick your plan giving mailing that you had planned for April or May, kick it until a little bit later in the year uh, if, you need to, if you need to for financial purposes. But I would still try to get it out no matter what in 2020 if you can. Uh, number two option uh, be after don't, don't do it or do it later, would be do it, but do not try to bring COVID and plan giving together and say, hey, all these people you know, are dying or all these people are infected and that might have you thinking about X, Y, Z. Don't try to conflate these things. It, it could come across as pretty insensitive and, and likely would. So if you're going to do it, it goes to number three, I would instead try to make the connection uh, between the tax benefits or a few things in this new bill that uh, regarding plan giving that could be a tax benefit. So try to connect it. Maybe it's a, here's an update on the outlook of, you know, estate planning coming out of the new, the new bill that came out of Congress. Or the other option according with number three is, um, you know, just make it a general update. Just ignore kind of what's going on and it's just your usual mailing. That's not ideal as we've been talking about here because you want to be sensitive to what's going on. So, um, you know, really go with do it later or do it, but really connect it with not necessarily COVID, but connect it with maybe what's going on with the bill that just passed in Congress. Um, hopefully that's helpful. But someone asks, they have a house file that is um, primarily made up of family foundations or, or and staffed foundations. I think they said 90 or 95%. So they were kind of curious what sh they should do there. Um, I'm going to assume since your house file is made up of 90 to 95% foundations that you probably have a pretty small house file. And 
uh, that's okay. But with that, I would make sure that messaging is is very tailored, very uh, customized to them. If it's if again you have a small house file given this, you could probably do all these mailings one off. Uh, maybe you don't need to use a print shop. Um, unique customized message from your president if they're funding a specific project. Maybe give an update on that project. Uh, a lot of foundations are curious about your sustainability, and a lot of foundations ask those questions during application processes. So let them know, here are the things we've done internally to adjust to the, this new world that we're in to save costs and you know, keep up impact. Uh, but if, you're found, if your house file is heavy on those foundations, I would, I would uh, take that tact uh, of giving them a very personalized update. So we'll look at some of these other questions here. Um, one question is, we, um, Eric or Olivia, whichever one you want to, uh, wants to take it, we don't already have a direct mail program. Should we start one right now? I would take it to uh, Olivia answer that first since it's more of an acquisition side. Uh, could be an acquisition depending. Well, let me start. I don't know the full amount. Like, like do they have a database already, right? So if they have already existing donors, I would say, yes, let's start communicating with them. Could be a mixture of digital. It could be a mixture of direct mail. So communicating with any existing constituents you have. Uh, I think that there's nothing wrong with that, especially if it's a small group, it's not going to be a huge um, uh, lift on expense side to really make an impact there and get it, get your voice out there. I think on the acquisition side, I want to hear what Olivia says, but on the acquisition side, again, depending on what your growth strategies are, this may not be the time to launch an acquisition if your organization isn't necessarily well known to your audience. Like if your brand is not like a household name or an organization, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time like trying to convince them to support you. It may be a difficult time to do that. Uh, but um, so that it would be some other particulars on that. And I'd love to talk about it, at, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one even with that to see if there might be something there that might be a possibility. But it depends on, you know, your, 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 um, your perception in the marketplace, right? Because you're going to be spending a lot of money to get people to know who you are, if that makes sense. Olivia, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I would agree that if you don't have a current um, acquisition program in mail and you don't have a good brand awareness, it might not be the best time in the next in the current month or two uh, in order to kick off an acquisition campaign. We all know that acquisition is expensive uh, relative to, you know, we all, you know, very few people make money on acquisition anymore. Those days are gone. Um, and so getting justification from your boards to spend it is even harder. So you don't want to come out with your first uh, acquisition campaign at subpar results uh, and then have difficulty getting funding later. So uh, I would agree with the same comments that Eric said. Um, I do notice, Justin, there's a question in the chat. Maybe you're going to go next to that about regionalization and how that could impact message and mailing. So if you don't mind, I'd love to jump in sure. on that one. Yep. Why don't you go ahead okay. and do that? And then, yep. Yeah, so I think that's a that's a great question, and um, and it certainly speaks to the fluidity of the situation uh, that's going on right now. Um, I did talk to a major nonprofit just this week, uh, who normally uses a printed letter in their acquisition campaign, uh, because you know from a cost perspective, it's less expensive to print the letter and then uh, and then laser a separate reply device, and so that's the method that they've always used for their control. They're going forward actually changing that effective immediately. Uh, to being fully lasered letters so they could be uh, responsive to the situation as it changes, costing them a little bit more uh, upfront production, but feeling like they have greater flexibility to change their messaging. And I do think the interesting thing that you mentioned about California and New York is you're right. I mean, they're, for, they're not only weeks ahead, but because of the density of the population, they're certainly having greater numbers. I was interested to hear that um, New York uh, not only do they have almost half the cases, I believe, uh, from the last figure that I saw yesterday on CNN um, uh, in the U.S., but they're mostly in the New York area. So obviously what's going on there is not quite the same as what's happening in Montana and Texas and other states. So that's where <clears throat> both having the ability to laser, maybe um, to do some selective um, uh, zip codes, though there is no problem with delivery anywhere, and we have confirmed that. We have people who watch that daily. We make adjustments uh, and make recommendations to clients when we have hurricanes and other things of what postal zip codes are, are not uh, having uh, delivery issues or having delivery issues. We don't have any of that going on today. 
but it certainly may speak that different parts of the country are feeling this differently, uh, but it's going to change quickly. So you do have to be able to be nimble, whether you're using email or lasered letters, or in some cases, I've also heard a couple people go to first class. Now, that's going to be for your best donors, right? You're not going to want to spend that on a low, low dollar donor, but that's also going to get your message there faster while things are still fresh and relevant to your piece. So, thank you. A uh, question that should, could just be, I think, hopefully a rapid fire one here. There's a lot of print houses. We've had several, five or six people ask about this. Print houses are closed in certain areas. Um, you know, what, what do we do about, and we can't go to the office because of shelter in place. How do, we, how do we get certain things printed? Um, and maybe on the same thing, if you, for some groups, use caging companies to collect all their checks and process them, what's going to happen all, all with that? I think there's a pretty quick answer. I know you and Eric, uh, Eric and I have talked about this. Yep. So I'll, I'll take that real quickly, the, the straightforward. You know, the printing side, we're not sure what's going to happen. Right now, all the printers we're working for, uh, working with, rather, have not been impacted at all. They Most of them have come forward with some kind of a, uh, a continuity process. If they have other plants, they could move things around if needed. If, if a plant does get infected, as an example, that they could move things to another plant. So printing wise, in general, with who we're working with, we're okay. If you're using a small regional printer, you may run into a problem. But if you've ever been in a print shop, many times they're not, they're not close, they're living social distancing anyway. Though, you know, one guy's at the front of the press room, there might be someone else at the back end. They're sometimes 30 feet away from each other. So it, it, the likelihood something's gonna impact there, it's not. It's right now considered, from what I understand, considered essential business, kind of business um, along with the Postal Service and all that. So we're not anticipating that right now but we're prepared for it to move things if needed. And you may have to do the same thing. Regarding caging, the larger caging companies, the Merkels, the DMPs, the Aegises of the world have all come out and said they're functioning, they're working. They've had a little bit of a slowdown. Uh, some staff has to go home for whatever reason, or they have kids or kids are out of school and things like that. But again, they have contingency plans to keep, keep the mail opening. Because even the nonprofit sector is only one sector, right? There's still bills that have to be paid insurances that have to be paid and things like that. And they're caging all that stuff as well. So it's considered an essential business as well. Another rapid fire one here. We uh, a few questions and bringing them all together. Uh, people are asking, how do we save money just over the next couple months? We want to do mail, but how do we save money? Should we, someone asked, should we concentrate on maybe just the highest donors over the last few years or just, just most active over the last fiscal year? Should we cut that insert that we were going to put in there? Uh, maybe just some rapid fire suggestions. Well, rapid fire for me and then I'll let Olivia. For house file mailings, for sure, um, refine your contact strategy. Like if you're like an organization and we have clients who like to do this and want to do it, it's not necessarily what we recommend all the time, but mail go back five years or something like that, even on a house file mail because they're reactive, they're always trying to reactivate something like that. Probably want to pull back on that. Let's stick with the stick back, you know, refine your contact strategy. Uh, to more recency, we talked about that. So the more recent donors <clears throat> and maybe the larger donors or more frequent donors, people that give. You know, if you're going back three years, maybe you only go to the people that give, uh, you know, have given three or four or five times in their lifetime or something like that, that they, their last gift was three years ago. That could be a potential for you. Olivia, do you have a quick, quick response, Olivia? Yes, um, I would agree with you. This is where segmentation becomes important, but also don't obsess over those costs because when you look at the cost, it's such a fraction, especially on house file mailings, on your return on in investment. You're spending a, you know, a handful of names you save, you might save 500, a couple thousand in your mailing. You know, your return on investment on those names is usually significantly more on house file size. So don't get caught in the weeds on that and don't let that prevent something from going out in the mail. I, I have worked with a number of organizations who get, um, and I will go back to when I used to work uh, with a lot of disaster related organizations. So much time was spent on noodling copy that, we, that windows of time were lost when it should have just gone out the door. Um, and the, this word or that word would not have made a significant difference. The timing was more important. So don't get lost in the weeds on cost in the same way. Very true. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. A few people have asked, and I'll just uh, get this one. A few people have asked, what does it mean? We've used the word, what does it mean to laser uh, on a letter? That just means to add in variable data um, throughout the letter, uh, if you're asking that. Um, 
So I think this is probably a quick answer. Uh, people are going to be getting checks here pretty quickly for $1,200 or, or less or more. Um, should you ask people, if you don't need the check, send it to us because we're doing good work or is that probably don't do that. My suggestion is, I don't know, that seems hard to pull off in the mail making that that ask. But uh, Olivia or Eric, I don't know if you have to I wouldn't do that. My, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd have to think that through. My gut uh, being thrown that question on the fly is, yeah, maybe avoid that uh, reference. And, and yeah, back, I think back to content, you also have to look at this. That's a, that comes back to context also. Like, is it in a week from now? We don't know what shoe's going to drop in two weeks. Like, what you, you have to, you have to, you know, we just don't know what's going to be happening. It's going to be interesting. But go ahead, Olivia. Yeah, no, exactly. We don't know when those checks are actually going to arrive. And obviously with direct mail, that becomes very difficult to time. It's probably more an issue of once we know checks are in hand, uh, then communications, at least maybe ramping it up so that you are there while they're feeling a little more flush. We also have to look at the income levels, right? Look at the people who are getting the checks and those who are not. There's clearly a, a section of the, of the population that is not getting it based on their incomes. And so those are your most generous donors in many cases as well. So um, those people will be giving and giving without the checks. Uh, the ones on the lower socioeconomic scale, they're the ones who probably may need it to pay some of the bills and the rent. So I agree with you, it doesn't feel right to go in and actually ask for the check, but to have your timing and communications be when people are feeling a little more flush. I remember, you know, it's always good to do your telemarketing calls the day after payday, right? It's the same kind of concept. Mm -hmm. People are feeling like they have a little bit more in their pocketbooks. Hey, by the way, on that note, uh, there's some studies out there, some graphs that are kicking around. Uh, we could share that another point uh, that show that actually during downturns and different times, when there's bound downturns, there's certain sectors that actually do better regardless. People want to give, uh, particularly when there's people they know people are hurting or friends or family lost their jobs. People get it that they want to give. If you're a certain kind of organization, it, it may be a little more difficult, but if you're in human services, social services, things like that, your giving may go up and as Olivia mentioned, time it right. So when they have the flush with the money or whatever, uh, that may be in the what, if, what would you recommend if you're an organization that just sent a letter to say to your house file so you know who the people are and it just hit and you didn't have time to alter the language, it was already on the printer getting off, so they're getting letters about whatever it is was relevant three weeks ago or two weeks ago and they're getting that letter now. Would you recommend following up with them and saying, hey, sorry, this went out the door or just checking in or... Um, and even generally speaking, if you're having a house file mail letter going right now and you even are addressing the issue. Would you call those donors just to be extra sensitive? So I think uh, over communicating is great. So uh, I would not reference the, the appeal itself. Say, hey, I know you just got this. I wouldn't be that explicit uh, because I think I've gotten some of those at home already that it's like it clearly was in the works. Uh, and, you know, most people I think kind of um, that that was something that was in the works. If in three weeks that happens, four weeks, it's another issue. But I would over communicate. Yeah, I think start uh, doing the email chases we talked about, reinforcing that message platform we talked about, uh, reinforcing that, and just start to uh, supplement the other direct mail that's out there with your core message uh, for sure. I'm, I'm already seeing that even in digital. I'm like wondering, like you saw some paid advertising. It's on CNN. It was a very dire story uh, about what's going on. Dire. I don't know if that's the right word or not. Uh, but uh, the ads below were like 3% mortgage rates and, and invest in the, like, who's, like, really? Are you, why are you giving me an ad? Like, it, no reference to anything. Even when I clicked through, it had no reference to anything going on. So very, you know, that does come across tone deaf. So you got to be careful. Would this be a good time to start uh, pushing plan, uh, excuse me, not plan giving, monthly giving or quarterly giving more than usual? Hey, you know, again, we're asking for larger, maybe $500 gifts, but maybe instead in our direct mail, we're asking people to uh, ask, make $25 gifts, you know, every month or whatever. I'm not, I'm, I have no opinion. I, I think yes. My opinion is yes. And particularly if you're in one of those sectors, you're in an organization where your program needs are increasing, not decreasing. What a great time. Go out and tell your story. Be real about it. This is happening with social service organizations all around the country that are finding their needs increasing, not decreasing. Go tell your audience that. Say, hey, this is a great time to help us monthly, help us get through this. 
we have staff and you know whatever it might be whatever your 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 offer is olivia any yeah i would i would agree with that i think again back to my earlier comment where people want to feel like they have some control and they're making a difference and so being able to join something like a new sustainer program if uh if they're already uh bound into your mission this is a good time possibly even to upgrade them to that mm -hmm. Somebody so part of, the organization, part of one of the things that American Philanthropic, and it, it's a concept and principle that Jeremy Bear, uh, Bear is, it, it talks about all the time, identity and belonging, right? People want to have identify with your organization. They want to have a sense of belonging. And the monthly giving programs do exactly that. They have an identity that's like they identify with that and they have a sense of belonging. And again, if you're in a certain sector, this, there's no better time than drawing people into your community and to your mission and who you are. Um, Next question that we have here is uh, if you're at an organization that's been sort of building up an individual giving program over the past six months or so um, and haven't quite gotten to um, sending direct mail, should they start that right now? Like is now a good time to begin direct mail if they had plans to or like hold off for a couple months? So it comes back to the uh, before, I guess the thing is if they have existing donors, um, and uh, I would say yes, to communicate in direct mail, people are at home, they're going to their mailbox, they love when they get a letter, uh, and if it's an organization they've either already donated to or been a, a member of or been involved in some way, shape, or form, they're going to love getting something from you. Uh, if it's relevant and all the things we talked about earlier. So I would say yes. If it's acquisition, I would say what we talked about earlier, uh, and myself and Olivia saying maybe hold off unless you have some brand that people are very familiar with. Great. Um, any any ideas on? Uh, well, this is our last question. Uh, any ideas on how to save money on a May uh, house file or prospecting draft that's coming up? How to save money on a May on something mailing in May? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like an acquisition, like a. If it's I think either one. So, uh, you know, I know you mentioned sort of limiting the testing you're going to do um, and maybe mailing a smaller segment. Any other ideas on, on money saving? If it's acquisition, um, you know, a couple of I mean, it's ref it could potentially be refining that and pulling back. Uh, I think we may have talked about that earlier. Maybe you're not going as deep into test lists that you never tested as an example that we're not going to mail into unknowns or something like that. But if you have a continuation list, a list that you've mailed to before that's worked, and you have a retest and a list that worked and you want to see if it's working again, and you have your lapsed donors that are always going to outperform it, any of those, and then you have your potential of a Wyland and a co-op and things like that that are good performers, uh, you want to continue those, but maybe peel off and work with, you know, Wyland or whoever you're using for that kind of thing, peel off some of the less uh, ones that will have a lower return on investment. But to Olivia's point, it, it, you got to determine, is that saving us thousands or hundreds or, or pennies? Uh, and then determine, is it worth it? Otherwise, there's very few things you can do. Most mailers, in particular, if it's a large mailing, are going to be doing the nonprofit pre-sort and all that and get you in the mail for 15, 16, 17 cents, something like that. So you, that's the big area. The list area, you know, it's, it's yeah, it's going to be difficult if it's already in the pipeline. Awesome. <clears throat> thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks, Olivia. And thanks, Justin. We'll wrap it up there. So we'll be back uh, same time, same place next week. Uh, next week, we'll be discussing in-person events. We've gotten a few questions about that. I tried to shoot back some answers to you. Um, but we'll spend a lot of time both with articles next week on Philanthropy Daily and uh, in the webinar. We'll have um, Janine Ryan, the Director of Events at the Heritage Foundation. She'll join us with some thoughts and suggestions for uh, dealing with canceled events and recovering uh, the lost revenue that'll come with that. Um, also, these recordings are available at philanthropydaily.com. At the top of the page, there's a button for webinars. Feel free to share them around if you think uh, they'll be beneficial to anyone. Uh, finally, we're looking into providing resources or webinars for specific industries too, like higher education or church parishes, for instance. Please let us know if you're in a specific industry that you'd like to address. Uh, you can shoot me or Justin an email if you'd like, um, if you have any ideas there. Uh, as we said, we know that the nonprofit sector is extremely vulnerable during economic downturns. 
we also think the nonprofit sector is essential to a healthy civil society. So we're doing everything we can to help fundraisers and uh, nonprofit professionals. Please use the resources, be in touch, let us know how else we can help. Um, and we will, uh, we'll see you next week.